Hey, welcome to Guitar Knobs, the guitars, gear, noise, and nonsense podcast hosted today by these knobs. Tony Dudzik, Pick Guardian. Jared Brandon, down in Tennessee. <laughs> with the announcer voice. The, the moonshine <laughs> state. <laughs> I can't just get away with a normal announcement. No, you it's can't. always critique. It's different every time. That's live. It's critique live every time. Hey, everybody. It's me, Todd Ovec. Welcome to the Guitar Knobs Podcast. We are thrilled to <laughs> death. <laughs> yes. Even that you are listening to our show uh, where we love to hang out and talk about gear. Yep. People that make the gear. Yep. People that are uh, influencing in di- in all kinds of different ways yep. and just shaking things up. We love it. Yes. It's just a couple of hound dogs sitting around a backyard looking at the sun, really. Wow. <laughs> I don't know where that That's came from. Do. do not stare in directly <laughs> into the sun. Yeah. yeah. Uh, anyways, we, speaking of hound dogs, got a special, special guest. Uh, hound dog, who are you? Alex Garaldi, Copper Sound Pedals. Right on. Uh, for, I think this is number three. Trace. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's not that we're like going like, well, now what do we do? Like, <laughs> he's got good stuff. And it's, and it's uh, you know, worthy of talking about. So we're happy to have him on. Um, and uh, Welcome back again. Yes, sir. Welcome back. Thank you. Thank you. And I before we get any further... Do you have an angry voice? Like, do people know when you're angry? Because you are one chill suspect. You wouldn't like to see me angry, Todd. Is that your angry voice? (laughs) (laughs) Do you you turn green and tear off your clothes and stuff? I don't think um, I don't think I get into the angry thing as much as I get into like if there's a subject or a topic we're talking about. I might get into a rant. Uh huh. Ah. Um, like a passionate walk around rant, not necessarily sure. angry about stuff. I don't generally get that. Right. Yeah. Your your yeah. previous uh, attempt at that reminded me of, of Hank from uh, Cable Town. I don't know if you can <laughs> tell by the sound of my voice, but I'm really upset. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's a good, that guy's fantastic. Nice. You know, he was the uh, original coach on The White Shadow, one of my oh favorite my TV shows. I remember that oh, show. Oh, man, that was such a great show. Actually, I that show, so it was about this, uh, it was kind of like a, t- uh, not a Ted Knight character. That would have been really funny. Bobby Knight. <laughs> Ted Knight as Bobby Knight. That would be a show right there. Anyways, Bobby Knight, he was like a white um uh, coach and he was coaching this sort of inner city group of kids and and it was um it was much about a lot of topic at the time you know you had all in the family and all this stuff that was going on and and people were trying to address problems of the day which insanely enough we still have them right now which is mind-boggling uh but i remember watching one shit one of those episodes and it scared me to death. And from that point on, I was like kind of actually paranoid that I was just going to be riding my bicycle. And all of a sudden I'd be like, ah, and have a brain aneurysm and die. Hmm. Because one of the players was like, he was like, run down the court. He's a star player. And, and all of a sudden he just goes, ah, and he falls down and dies. And they said, oh, you had a brain aneurysm. Scared the freaking crap out of me. I was for ages. I just still think about that, actually. Man, that made a big impact on me. Thanks a lot, White Shadow, for making me a nervous wreck. Okay, mm. anyways, so let's... <laughs> you know what TV episode I liked? Uh, what? The, the Quincy punk rock episode. Mm-hmm. That is a classic. Yeah. You can catch it. I'll have to dig out what the, the title of that was. But yeah. Yes, there's a, they have some great punk rock scenes, and one of the people gets... Ice picked. Yeah. He had the guy that kind of looked like Darby Crash from the Germs, but it wasn't. No, no, but it was meant to. <laughs> At any rate. Um, well, you let's, know what my favorite episode is? Well, we were, gonna about, we were just about to ask you, Jared. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I don't know that show. <laughs> okay. Um, Alex, do you, you want to chime in? Or? You that's, lost me after Cable Town. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's from 30 Rock. I know. Yeah, okay. Gotcha. All right. All right, everybody. Well, let's, uh, we're going to have some fun. We need to thank a few people. Mike, thank you for supplying all this fantastic equipment that we get to use uh, to do this show. Yes. I also um, want to 
basically just think Patreon. I know I don't for no good reason other than they're providing us a way to really exist. Mm-hmm. And um in that the, there's the supporters and and aside from that support it's created a a, a community uh, of sorts, even amongst the patrons themselves, um, we've had so many discussions about it, and it's really remarkable. So, yeah, I'm glad that's out there. Thank you for people making things of all shapes and sizes. It makes the world go round. Is there anyone else you'd like to thank? My mom <laughs> and dad. He had some to do with it too. Before we get any further, we need to make sure that people know where to go to check out Copper Sound. Um, uh, products as they are. Alex, where should people go? So our URL is coppersoundpedals.com. We've got social medias. Our most active ones are probably Instagram and Facebook. Um, for, for if you're following along at home or if you want to check it out, I'd say one of those three would be your best bet. And if you can't figure it out, ask a friend. Yeah. Uh, let's get on with this. What is going on in our music world this week? We're going to start off with Antony. And then we're going to check in with Alex. Go ahead, Andy. Well, this week, Todd, I was saddened because on my birthday, uh, one of the guitar greats, Jeff Beck, passed away. Yeah. Um, now, I'll be the first to say I'm not a huge Jeff Beck fan. I mean, I can listen to his music, and some of it's pretty cool. But by and large, I'm, I, I admire what he did with guitar and what he did over a 50 or 60 year uh, career in music. Um, I first was familiar with Jeff's work in the Yardbirds, uh, which he was hired to replace Eric Clapton when he left and brought on board by his school buddy, uh, James Page, I think was his name, some, some other guitar player. And that was kind of the classic era, I, I would say, after Clapton left, of, of what I would consider the classic era of the Yardbirds. And they, um, you know, he, he, he did some really cool things. And, you know, one of the guitars that he's probably most recognized for that he used in the Yardbirds was a 54 Esquire, uh, tell you, or a Fender Esquire which had been... Um, Explain what an Esquire is for those that may not know. An Esquire is a Telecaster without a neck pickup. Um, essentially the same guitar, but because there's no neck pickup, some would say that there is less magnetic pull on the strings and they can hear a difference. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's true to some degree. I just like the simplicity of it a little bit more. Um, mm, but It was the OG New School. Well, it was actually the option that Leo Fender <laughs> I mean, decided. Because one pickup guitars are like a huge thing right now. Well, they were. I the, know they uh, were, but I'm saying they have risen and they've skyrocketed in popularity as of okay. late. Okay, I'll, I'll give you that. Okay, so thanks. the the one thing that made this somewhat different than other uh, broad or uh, broadcasters, Telecaster. Esquires. Well, you're hitting all of them. <laughs> I'm in them all. I got all the models. Yeah. Um, is uh, his particular guitar had a belly cut and an arm contour, much like a Strat. Which was ironic because he was a slender man. Yeah. Well, that, I, I always thought that he was the one that did that to that guitar. But mm. in reality, he got that guitar from uh, Scott Walk- Walker of the Walker Brothers. I forget what his real name is, but the uh, Walker Brothers had a big hit. Uh, the sun ain't gonna shine anymore. Okay, look it up. Yeah, it's a great song. Sure. Um, <laughs> and the Yardbirds were touring with the Walker Brothers, uh-huh. and Jeff talked Scott Walker into letting him buy that guitar because he wanted it. And uh, apparently, when Jeff got it, it had already had those contours cut into it. Interesting. So. Um, so there's a there's a there's a little little bit of boy off. really killed the value on that thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and over the years, of course, it ended up. Uh, Jeff gifted it to Seymour Duncan, uh, and uh, Seymour, I believe, still owns that today. Is that true, Jared? I'm not sure. 
Okay. I imagine he would though. I, yeah, I that would be one to hold on to. Sell that. Yeah, of course. But uh but yeah, I mean, uh his style was was really I mean, just incredible. He was a true innovator and the Nobody one Nobody sounded like that, dude. No, and what the one thing in probably late 70s into the 80s and beyond uh when he primarily played strats um is he would um you know, he he could do swells with his pinky for the volume. He also used didn't use a pick at that area. He he used his thumb, mm-hmm. and then he had one hand resting on the uh, on the trem bar. Which, Always, yeah. And I mean, he could make um, I think the guitar sound very much like a human voice. Oh yeah, and that in and of itself, you know, deserves a gold star uh, yeah. in my book. He like anti played that guitar in the sense that he wasn't he wasn't like playing. In the in a, in any kind of conventional way at all. That's true. That's true. Yeah. So and and mostly improvising. Yes. Yeah. I mean, for the most part. I mean, he was, you know, he he he, he bridged, you know, between blues and rock and, and jazz and, funk and, 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 and I mean, he did it all. So maybe not funk. Uh, there's some funky stuff some out funk, there. Yeah. Some funk. And he's he played with just about everybody over the Surf, years. Surf ska. <laughs> yeah, surf ska. <laughs> yeah, he was big into surf ska. <laughs> but anyhow, so a big, you know, hats off to to Jeff Beck. The, the the thing that really bugs me about this, yeah, is there are a lot of big players that are now in their seventies and eighties, and I unfortunately suspect that we're going to have the dominoes are going to fall, man. Yeah, it's it, and that that saddens me even more. So I agree on that on that up note. And, and you, you know what? Like I'd been aware of Jeff Beck for a long time, but because it, uh, just like not even close to the same zip code of styles of music, um, I, I really haven't uh, heard a ton of him. You know, mm-hmm. little bits, you know, and yeah. stuff. And you're like, holy mackerel, that guy's amazing. Blah blah blah. Right? I was uh, driving back from Georgia, and I had just. Uh, finished the uh, Keith Richards biography, Life. I started reading it and then realized I don't, I never have time to read, so I just listen to everything. And um, after that, I said, well, I'm going to listen. I'm just going to put on Keith Richards and just like listen because his solo stuff, I really like his solo stuff. Oh, yeah. A lot. Um, But it hit this one song and at first I could tell where it was going because it was like classic, like Mississippi, you know, and and or Chicago blues, you know, just kind of lump all that stuff together. And it, um, a buddy guy was it was a song cognac. Oh yeah, and, yeah, and, yeah. And it and it came up, and I almost I almost said no because I just <laughs> I can't like one or two songs maybe, and then I'm like okay, I'm I'm just done with that. I just it it, it doesn't it doesn't hit me. But the song was cognac. And the lyrics are funny. And it's Jeff Beck and Keith Richards and Buddy Guy. I'm like, well, I kind of have to listen to this. <laughs> and it was absolutely amazing. I, I needed a kickstand for my jaw <laughs> driving because I was like, I, I, I it, this, the sounds that were coming out and the phrasings and the voicings he was doing, just unbelievable. And uh, that made me really happy just driving, just listening to this guy do a thing that he can do better than anybody else on the planet. Yeah. And that was that was cool. You want to you want to hear a funny story about the yardbirds? No, <laughs> I was hoping you'd share one. <laughs> I'm going to. Now this I goes mean, back- when I was driving here I was like, "Oh golly, I hope he shares a great story about the yardbirds." <laughs> so, in the early days of the yardbirds, when Clapton was still with them, um they also did some backup work for Sonny Boy Williamson. And I think the quote, I'll paraphrase it pretty much. But Wait, but before, you, before you take a se- second, any more steps? Yes. Alex, are you a blues guy? A mm, little bit. I don't, I don't go too far into those waters for... for uh, Do you go into the muddy waters? Muddy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think for, for like blues, rock type of stuff, um, some of like my go-tos, I mean, anything Mark Knopfler is good for me. Oh, yeah, that's, um, that's borderline. So, you know, some Almond Brothers, but again, more like blues rock type stuff. Right. Yeah. You know, there's some R&B, obviously, with uh, anything Knopfler does. Okay. 
this again, speaking of finger pickers. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So um, please continue. So I will continue. One. So uh, so when asked about the Yardbirds, uh, Sonny Boy said something to the effect that those English boys wanted to play the blues real bad, and that's how they played it, real bad. <laughs> <laughs> really? Yeah. Oh, Sonny, was, Sonny was not a fan. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah. I mean, what are you going to do? There you go. Uh, but at least Jeff Beck wasn't in the band at that time. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, they all tried it. Everybody went had to go. Yes. Okay, let's move on. Uh, Alex, what's going on in your music world this week, my friend? Uh, so I recently had the opportunity to have lunch with a local friend and pedal builder and friend of the show, the guy that uh, you have to drink after you say his name. Uh, say it. John Snyder. Drink. drink. <laughs> so John and I try to get together every so often just to talk shop and, um, you know, swap war stories, what's going on, that type of stuff. Um, So we recently got together. We're also joined by another mutual friend and Boston builder, uh, Mr. Bill Finnegan, to join us for lunch. What a table that was. Hmm. Yeah, so that was was definitely a a fun lunch. Um, The three of us had been talking recently about um, getting together, not necessarily to do anything together as far as like a product, or anything of that extent, but I had been talking to Bill since last spring or so. Um, kind of, he's been picking my brain about a lot of the more modern day um, techniques, locations, fabrication, stuff like that that he didn't have at his disposal in the '90s and in the early '90s and stuff like that. So um, we've just been kind of getting together weekly. We've been talking. He's been to the shop, and I'm going to try to help him through some of the uh, tribulations that he's been facing with um, his products. So hopefully soon we'll be getting more KTRs out there. Like supplies so, and stuff? Yeah, that type of thing. Fabrication, manufacturing, PCBA, um, things of that nature. So Bill and I have been talking for a while, and John's actually working with him. I won't say like what they're doing or anything like that, but um, John's in Boston, Bill's in Boston. So they've been working together and the three of us had mutual interests in some things. So we got together, we had some Mexican food, talked shop, um, got like a game plan going and stuff like that. Um, KTR exists. So obviously Bill's trying to get more stuff going and John's helping out on some aspects that I won't go into. I know he has talked about the KTR and stuff on um, a podcast with uh, Blake a tone mob so people can go listen to that if they want but um yeah so that was that was cool recently got to have lunch with uh, those three guys and that was a that was a fun uh discussion and fun lunch so i can imagine that's, yeah that's kind of been my music world you know i've been keeping in contact with bill and um john as well and i've seen him at a couple uh recent expos that we've done together small trade shows and stuff like that so we all have this mutual interest so we got together for lunch um, which was which was really fun to do and um, have Bill come along too because we had like two generations of builders at the table. Yeah, yeah. You know. That's really so, cool. So hey. yeah, so hopefully we'll be doing some stuff together. Not Like I said, not necessarily a product together, but in some capacity, the three of us will be benefiting all collectively and um, I'm doing my best to try to help Bill traverse some of the modern day perils and stuff and help get more KTRs out there for people to play. Amazing. I think that's, that's uh pretty cool stuff. And, you know, w- without speculating, you know, that would be very interesting if there was something else introduced into the wild by Mr. Mr. Bill. Um, yeah, I won't, I won't, obviously I'm not, gonna, yeah. I'm not at liberty to say anything on those regards for any, um, I'm behind the curtain and, uh, playing the respectful game but yeah it's it's been a while and he's gone through a lot of stuff and john and i are just kind of there to like help him traverse like the modern day things because you know john and i are um you know we're kind of at the forefront of like supplier manufacturing modern day engineering things john's a whiz at everything so and he's an open book so i'm using some of i um, offering some of my skill sets in certain facets and John is as well just you know three greater Boston area guys getting together for some lunch so we'll see what happens from there hey by the way uh, nerd knuckle 
Do you talk to Brad, Brad, to Brad at all? Is, Brad is McComer? He, yeah, how's yeah, he doing? I, yeah, I spoke with Brad um, at, we did an event in Connecticut at Martell Music. Um, that was November 12th we did that. I spoke with him last um He's doing good. He's always chipper, always happy, always good to see him. I know him and John had recently moved to a new shop. They essentially got kicked out of their current location, and they found a new shop. They are now above SynthCube, who owns Small Bear Electronics, oh. and they, hmm. the top floor is now turned into like a space for musicians, which is really cool, and those guys are occupying part of that. Um, a melding yeah. of the minds. Yeah. That's yeah. really no, cool, Brad's, man. Brad, Brad's great. He's a good guy. I built a bench for their shop here and brought it to John's shop about a year ago. Um, and he's been, that's essentially been his workstation. Um, always fun to talk to. That I, sounds I like think... the most Boston thing ever. <laughs> I build a bench for his shop. Other places yep. you bring a pie or a cake. I don't know why, but that just. <laughs> <laughs> he needed a bench for his shop. I built him a bench, you know? <laughs> yeah. That's very kind. Nice. Yeah. Graduating from high school, Tommy. I'm going to build you a bench for your shop. Anyways. He's a good dear. dude. Yeah, he is. Well, please say hello if you, if you haven't. Uh, we'll have to reach out to him and, and see what's going on. Um, How about Jared? Yep. Oh, man. So, uh, Today, I picked up my Reverend, my six gun, which I bought directly from Ken. Oh, nice. Uh, love that guitar. Um, and I, I put some of my own pickups in it. Of course, I couldn't keep my hands out of it. Um, and I just noticed the bridge pickup was dead. And I'm kind of excited because I actually get to work on a pick, like work on a repair. I haven't worked on a repair in a year and a half. <laughs> I finally, you know, I get to solve a problem again instead of create new. So uh, I'm <laughs> kind of excited about that, you know. Uh, yeah. So what's the so, pickup uh, configuration in a six gun? Uh, so the one that I bought had two, um, a middle and a neck where the Strat and a Telecaster bridge. Oh, okay. Was the was the bridge, and it had the base cut and all that kind of thing. But. Yep. Um, I'm I'm just more privy to the uh, HH configuration in this guitar. I I did a screen top um, set in these and uh, made the bridge really hot. It's got the uh, it's it, it's a these are really well built guitars. Um, it's got a great uh, Wilkinson uh, trim on it. Mm -hmm. And um, is that and the baby I, blue I one? And, it is. The neck is is that uh, roasted maple. So I mean, I've always liked this guitar. I yeah. always like it. It's, it's a great little guitar. Tony, you made the pick art for it. In fact, you made me like two or three pick arts for this. I said, oh, make that's me right. an HH. Make me a, a lipstick. You know, if I want three lipsticks in it, and I still have it. I still have them all. But I just Perloid. I really like this. Yeah. But um, and I'm thinking about getting a um. I'm thinking about getting like a, a 54 uh, black Les Paul custom with the P90 in the bridge and a staple in the neck. Oh, that I've never had a staple guitar. Maybe two staples would be cool. Wait, 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 wait. You're thinking about getting a 50 what? Not a real one, okay. just a, a, a custom shop. <laughs> okay, a custom I mean, shop. Those model. are still expensive, with, but you know, with with the discount that I get, it's a little more affordable. But it's still expensive. I like that idea. So yeah, I'm, there's something cool. I'm looking. Kind of I mean, thinking. I'm not really sure. Maybe you can talk about uh, what the sound uh, or you know the the sonic qualities, or the audio qualities of a staple pickup are as opposed to the other ones. But they do look cool. <laughs> Yeah, I mean they're still really super. They're just kind of louder because they they have, you know, the more all Nico five sticking out for each string, and um, they're a little hot, you know, because of the shape of the bobbin, and they they put ten thousand wines on those, so they're they're kind of they're nice and boomy, and they're great sounding pickups. Cool. We'll we'll uh, we'll get we'll, we'll get it in your hands one of these days, and you can check it out. But I like that. Yeah, so that's that's kind of what's going on my uh, guitar mind right now. Cool, other nice. than uh, other than waking. Good, good, good. Well, Toddly, what about you? I uh, 
took my daughter back up to college. What, and, what about you, Todd? Oh, thanks, John. <laughs> <laughs> Alex, well played. Hey. Thank you. Um, I took my daughter back up to college uh, in Akron this weekend, and we were driving. It was kind of early morning. We were kind of shaking off the morning sort of cobwebs and stuff. Mm. And uh, I said, you know, and I'm tr not trying to make this like the, you know, the – the 60s, 70s uh, music show, but I said, there are a few bands that you can listen to, to in, in an entire trip. Rolling Stones, Tom Petty, maybe Dave not Clark so many Five. others. Dave, Dave Clark Five. <laughs> yeah. There's, there, <laughs> my point is there, there's not, there's not a, a great deal. Rush, you probably, that have like a, a huge library that, that isn't all just, you know, the top hits, you does know? Does he talk like a regular guy? I know him, and he does. Uh, anyway, so I put I put that on, and we were just kind of listening, and she, when she uh, gets, when gets like, anxious or is thinking about it, she kind of, like, gets quiet, you know? And so I was letting her do that, and but I didn't want to make that the whole trip because that's no fun because she's she was homesick, and, and she was going back. Anyways, mm. uh what so I, does she like to listen to? Uh, all kinds of stuff, honestly. I know that that is a gen very general, you know, thing. But well, maybe you should let her listen to her stuff instead of imposing your musical taste. Okay. On anyways, her. thanks, mm -hmm. thanks, internet uh, <laughs> help. Uh, so I said we were just listening to that, and I said, you know, I was I was telling her about how I was uh, I just finished the book and everything, and I was driving. Uh, and I was listening to uh, Can't You Hear Me Knocking. You know, I've heard that song a whole bunch of times, and, but there was something about, you know, when I was, it, I was just in the moment. And I was, ex I was explaining this to her, like just trying to get her, trying to, you know, spark the conversation. It's not like, I mean, we talk all the time, but sometimes, you know, when she just kind of like closes down because she's getting, you know, kind of heart heavy, uh, I want to keep that going, so... I was just explaining. I said, you know, I was listening to a song and I was coming through this this pass going from Georgia into Tennessee and everything. And it's interesting because that song starts out like a couple of theirs do, which isn't a standard way to start out a song. It's like you caught them in the middle of the song. Mm, I would agree. Which yes. I, I love that, right? And then you, then they do the, they go into the chorus, which actually kind of sounds like a bridge, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but, and the beautiful thing is that up to that point, they're playing pretty sparse and everything's pretty tight. Right. Mm -hmm. And the second stanza of the, of the chorus, which isn't really a big one. And again, it's sort of like an anti song because a chorus is usually big, but they don't go really big. They're cruise along. And then Charlie hits a single, and it's, he just got, does a, a tap on the bell of the ride symbol, and everything opens up right after that. Mm, and it absolutely. is just, it's just freaking glorious. And and yes. it just made me feel like freaking son of a batch of eggs. This. <laughs> I I just I love the music. I love the rock and roll, and I and I'm and I and I was just basking in it, and it was just it was absolutely amazing, mm. because then that chorus just opens up, and then they go back in to the verse, and and everybody's just playing like they're all adding their own stuff now. It's like it's re, it's loose, and it's and it's 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 a it's a much bigger dance. It's a that's symphony, and it is. It is, you know, when, if you just listen to it, it's, it's a great sound song. But if you really listen to it, take time and do that. Mm. And you'll just, it, it's like, I was trying to explain to her. It's like, if you imagine a couple of these guys on a dark stage with a spotlight. And then, and then all of a sudden, you know, when Charlie hits that, all the rest of the stage lights instantly come on. And there's a whole troop of people behind them it's like that's kind of what it was like but then they go into that santana bull crap and that is just absolutely wrecks the song it is <laughs> it is it is complete garbage that is the that is the worst ending to a song i can i can imagine really but then i started thinking a little bit more mm -hmm. you guys i would love for you to chime in um alex uh, you first please uh i was thinking of other moments 
where there where it's like it's a moment that you can you absolutely can count on and you wait for and you revel in right so like the yeah in uh in just what i needed from the cars the mm. first time it's the pause and then the yeah, you know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then the uh, the the big synth chord on Tom Sawyer, the first synth chord. And we were like, oh, yes, here we go. Seeing them live the minute they did that, it, it just goes bananas. Right. And the last one that I, that I will mention is from Number of the Beast. When Bruce Dickinson hits the yeah, the big scream, it's like. That's the reason that people go to the to the show. If nothing else, just for that. Like you can tell cuz everybody absolutely loses control of all faculties and it turns into a complete celebration just from this one thing just when he does it. So it made me think like what is that for other people? What are the first couple things that people think about? Alex. The f- so I'm thinking about it. The f- I'm sure I have a few that I could when I'm driving home tonight, I'm going to think of other ones. But the first one I thought of, um, and I guess I'm going to keep it obviously in the more modern realm this century, um, is the end of Taking Back Sunday's A Decade Under the Influence, where Fred's yelling, I got it bad at the very end, and it just, the band cuts out and he's screaming it. Uh It's the first one that I thought of, which is like, because I think what you're conveying kind of a lot of times or you're saying Todd is like that just like kind of in the moment emotion. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and that's so obviously a, a vocal is going to be an instant thing. It's because, especially because it transcends for non musicians as well. Yeah. So that's the first thing that I'm thinking about in like a modern era of like each time it's like, I'm almost waiting for it every time. Like it feels familiar yet fresh every time. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that, yeah, I would say that's the first one that I thought of. You know, uh, I'm going to chime in on that sort of note. I'm going to say it. I'm going to magically let everybody finish this. I am a patient boy. And if you know that, Fugazi. I'll wait, I'll wait, I'll wait. It's like you can't wait to chime in for that initial moment. Oh, man. Freaking love rock and roll. (laughs) (laughs) That's actually, that's a good question to like, almost like have on each episode, you know, kind of like a... Like when um, Blake does like, what's your favorite boss pedal or pizza? It's like, what's what's a, a moment that sticks for you in any song? That's one of those like, I almost want to like, like you're driving with somebody and it's like, you're going to turn it up a couple clicks. Exactly. Like, hey, hey, hey. But you're not going to tell him. You're not going to tell him. You're doing it on a, yeah. on a steering wheel. <laughs> Ex- yeah, exactly. You do it on the steering wheel just to really emphasize that part for yeah. them. Yeah. And, indeed. Uh, Tony, do you got one? Yeah, oh, yeah. Number one. Uh, Daltry's scream from "We Won't Get Fooled Again." Okay, yeah, that that one is is right up there. And to bring it into modern context or more modern context, um, there's something about "Smells Like Teen Spirit." You know, it starts off in that kind of soft, kind of grab, you know, light guitar, and then when it finally kicks in, when Grohl starts banging on the drums and everybody's in, that is just such an incredible build. Yeah. Interestingly, another bit of trivia when asked about how uh, how uh, Cobain came up with that song, he said, I was trying to write a Pixies song. Interesting. And I love the Pixies. Oh, yeah. Pixies are great. They have a new album out. <laughs> anyway, Jared, you got one, and then we'll move on. I got two. Uh, so the beginning of Over the Hills and Far Away on mm. Song Remains the Same, which is not in the VHS copy that you know, people had for years. It's actually on a final record version that's not been overdubbed for the movie. So Jimmy Page's like neck guitar tone, it's it's probably one of my absolute favorite guitar tones ever recorded. And it was recorded live. And ironically, we all know Page was kind of a little more on the sloppy side live, but this particular tone he had just I I live to hear that intro. And then another is the whole um, see me, hear me uh, in Tommy and probably the uh, the Woodstock version of that. Like the whole who set on that, the Woodstock version is just uh, performance to me is something that I'll I'll listen over and over for days. 
just because of the sound, how they played it, how they sang, how some of the singing wasn't done um, like it is on the record. It's just you can't you can't do that over again the same way it sounded in that particular performance. So those really unique performances for me um, that are not in recording studio are just that's what really turns me on when you when I yeah, listen to music. That's fair. You know, Todd, I'm sitting here at this table. Or as Alex said, blah, 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 patch cables. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is the blah, 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 patch cable segment. <laughs> I'm sitting here looking at these wonderful copper sound pedals, yet I don't have any way to connect them. Do you have any suggestions? I do. I do. And actually, it's in my, it's, they're connected to my pedal board, which is right over here. Huh. Uh, those are the Tour Gear Designs patch cables. Ooh. Yeah. With the flat ones, the, the very flat, flat ones, ones yeah. with the multiple lengths and variable heads and different things like yeah, that. Indeed. And I'm going to interrupt this, this uh, broadcast because I was watching uh, on Instagram uh, and this guy was doing his, uh, his like, had a big setup where he had a, uh, a switcher and all this stuff, and he was trying to do all these cables and everything. He's like, well, this one's too big, and this one's so what I'm going to have to do. And instantly, this is how much the world is shaping us. I thought of the Leonardo DiCaprio thing where he goes, whoop, 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 whoop. That's me right there. <laughs> and I was like, tour gear, tour gear. <laughs> like, <laughs> honest, I swear that all happened in a blip of a second, but it's true. Oh, wow. The space-saving capabilities are remarkable and the durability and the durability and the affordability and the affordability all the illities yeah the, lots of illities yes. please go check out tour gear designs and uh, get yourself uh j you know what if you're like well, i don't know just get just get the little three pack it's like yeah. it's gonna cost you like what a couple bucks get the sampler yeah and that's uh and then if you use the guitar knobs in the coupon code you're gonna save 10 percent on your order which is gonna make you throw probably a few more in there because you're like heck i'm saving money let's get some more do it Go over to tourgatorsdesigns.com, do that, make yourself feel... One, two, one, two, three, four on the floor. All right, Alex Garaldi, Copper Sound Pedals, what's your new four on the floor? All right, so my first one for four on the floor, Todd, you're going to especially like this, for my favorite amp sound for when it comes to gain is Supro. So... Really? For my... For my pedal for my overdrive pedal i'm going with my always on my board jhs super bolt the first version mm. that they came out with um that's my that's my go-to drive sound i've always enjoyed um blues breaker um you know that's one of the reasons that we um came out with our fox catcher overdrive mm -hmm. two-in-one pedal um in 2016 but if I'm like, I recently had a buddy hit me up. It's like, hey, I'm available this weekend. You want to jam a little bit? So I threw together a board. The only drive pedal I put on there was the Super Bolt. Essentially, if I can grab and go and I'm going to pick one pedal for drive, it's going to be Super Bolt going into pretty much anything. If I'm not bringing my actual, like, I have a, fortunate enough, I have a vintage Gretsch uh, little one by eight, you know, similar to the Supro Supers, I think they are. Mm -hmm. The little tiny ones, yep. Gretsch, like the same, the sh same shop essentially. The Gretsch it just has the Gretsch badge on instead of a Supro one, and that's always kind of been my sound, the fall apart sound. You know, um, obviously a lot of people think of uh, first Zeppelin record and the Stairway to Heaven solo, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, if I'm going drive, I like that fall apart sound. You know, the Transformers not keeping up with it. Mm -hmm. uh, very dynamic. Like fingers is almost clean to the point of is it an overdrive and then you can really lay into it yeah yeah that's cool man i dig it what's next my number two i usually always have some type of uh boost pedal either pre or post um usually i would do something like our gravity bomb but for spreading the love here on this i'm actually going to go with the i have a mad mojo pedals flint hill preamp as my boost pedal. So if you're familiar or not at all, small builder, I believe he was in Colorado, move there or move from there. Um, we did some stuff. I traded a pedal, a couple pedals with him. Uh, he wanted me to do some relicking. So I relicked a couple pedals for him, sent it to him. 
then he sent me the Flint Hill because I really liked the the vibe of it. Um, so I would I would have that on my board as my preamp shaper, if I will, but most likely using it as like a a boost pedal, uh, right. either pre or post um, my Superbolt. So that'd be my number two. A little shout out to Mad Mojo. Check out check out their stuff. Right on. Number three. I'm going to go with um, industry buddy Philippe Herndon's Kilobyte. Mm-hmm. Again, I was fortunate enough I traded him a uh, custom Broadway matched his Nash Telly for a uh, Kilobyte that he was nice enough to send my way. And that's and, Caroline, just in case anybody's, you yeah. know. Yeah, yeah, Caroline Guitar Company, Kilobyte. I've got the um, the cream-colored one. It's like the 64-bit style one that yeah. they did. It's like, um, I think the... Uh, Angry guy is in like rainbow, yeah, and then uh, the rest of it's like uh, black and cream. The kilobyte word is like a little bit of more of like the Nintendo vibe. So I've got that. I really like that uh, as a delay pedal um, for some textures with the Havoc switch. Anybody that's not familiar somehow with that pedal should really check it out. Um, really cool stuff on there. And then my number four is still going to be. Um, my favorite pedal of all time, which is the Strymon Flint. Mm. That's a great one. Which uh, I I feel like that's one of those like universally, I don't feel like I've come across anybody that's like, yeah, I don't like it. No. (laughs) It's, you know, and and, uh, as much of a fanboy as I am of Strymon, to just, I can't get enough of that pedal. Like generally, if I had to cut my thing down to two pedals, that would be one of them, you know, or if I'm just going to grab my acoustic or electric and play into an amp, I'm probably going to just grab the Flint. Um, you know, it's got trem on it. It's got the reverb, um, stereo expression, all that type of stuff. Nice two in one, good size for that. It's so warm and and just it it, feels. It, it's it, like a nice blanket. It somehow does both. Um, can be just a good always on, or can take you to you know space, if you will. Yeah. Um, and I really, I really like that pedal. Um. I like it as an always on pedal. I also like stacking it with other reverbs. If you want to do like um, that type of big reverb sound, maybe um, in between songs, gapless type of stuff, you know, just let the thing go. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it's been a staple since I got one in, I want to say 2012. I've had it since. Nice. As my, as, as my go to. So yeah, there's my uh, quick and dirty four on the floor. Just out of curiosity, uh, have you had a chance to play with the Deco? I have. I love the deco. It was actually on my first four on the floor. I've I have yet to own one. That was a test. <laughs> yeah. Good it one, was, Todd. Uh, <laughs> bo- bo- both sides are great. The double tracker, um, the tape saturator. Like if I had a own if I if I had my pick at like another Strymon pedal next to get, it'd either be the deco or the Lex. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, nice. I'm definitely I'm, I'm I feel like the deco is super underrated. It, for Strymon stuff. Yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah, I mean, it came before their two drive pedals, the uh, Riverside and the Sunset, but... Which I are think both fantastic. Cool. Yeah, and, and yeah. I, I'm still... I'm on Team Deco, for sure. Yeah. Um, I got to play that at Alto Music, like, t- uh, way back in the day. Um, same time, The Haymaker from Caroline came out, and I got to play both of those at the same time, I think, and it was just really cool. It was just, like, the perfect... It, it was kind of like... Is kind of like seasoning, one of those philosophies where the perfect amount is right before it's too much. Mm-hmm. And I feel like that just, it had the it, if you will. Yeah, uh, I would agree. Def- I think that's one that people can, to to the point that you just made, um, actually, I think this could be applied to an awful lot of pedals, is that n- nobody's going to design the pedal to just be like at that stage. You have mm-hmm. a range for everything. But so often, some of these great pedals, like we all find that spot that we don't want to deviate from, mm-hmm. right? Uh, but a lot of times, if if a pedal offers too much, or that special spot range is so narrow, and you have to get all the knobs in a perfect combination for that mm-hmm. really special thing to happen, they can get dismissed, or not used, or or overused, or poorly used. Yeah, for sure. We it's interesting to say that we in our stuff we try to keep the philosophy of the entire knob feels like the whole range does something uh-huh. um, different enough from each so to speak position, 
but also never goes too far. It's kind of the opposite of EHX's philosophy. I feel like a lot of their pedals are 95% of the knob are the commonplace, and then the last five is just zany because why not, Mm -hmm. Um, which is fine as well. Our design philosophy generally tends to be it sounds good everywhere. Now, it might not be the case with every single knob in conjunction with its neighbor. Going back to the deco, as you mentioned, Todd, I feel like you could give some of the deco and say, hey, all those knobs, put them somewhere. Don't read anything. Just put them somewhere. Doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. And I bet you plug it in and it sounds good. That's totally fair. You know, I just feel like that's the way it is for, you know, it's not like some pedals, obviously you need like a wet dry mix. If somebody were to like put it all the way up, that might not be doable for you for like a mix. Yeah. Right. Some might be like, oh, if you maxed every single thing out, it's way too bright and harsh because it was designed to have a full range of tone and EQ and all that type of stuff. But applied correctly is fine Yeah. Um, to like counter dark amps or whatever it is. But I feel like with the deco, just you put it anywhere, it's gonna be good. Yeah. I don't disagree. Well, speaking of your pedals, let's speak of your pedals, uh, yeah. shall we? Uh, you sent us a, a little box full of a couple of pedals, and um, some are, are familiar and some are not. So let's get into what you have going on. Um, I think it's safe to say the biggest thing you have going on <laughs> is definitely the Telegraph. For sure, yeah. So I sent you guys um, a V2 of our Telegraph pedal for any new listeners or new to that model. Um, way back, we did for about, uh, I guess, uh, maybe around 2015 or so, 2016, when it actually like came around, we did about four years. We did a run of the original Telegraph stutter, which was... Um, uh, an intermittent kill switch and stutter box that featured a Morse code key on top so that the player could use their hand and kind of just interrupt their signal. Um, we did that for about four years. We discontinued it right before we did the collaboration with Jack White on the triple graph with Third Man. Um, that had a long run. I, I think if I recall in our serial numbers, before we discontinued it, we did about 2,200 of them oh, wow. for, for a couple guys in a garage. That was huge. You know, I often referred to that as kind of our business card. People have often found us and known about us through that. It's one of those pedals, kind of like the strategy in Broadway where you show somebody it and maybe they don't know the company or know it by name and they see it, they go, Oh, I've seen that before. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that was the first time that I remember seeing uh, you at an AM show. Um, right. I think you were just rolling it out. That might've been 15 or 16. 20, and, summer of 2016. Okay. Was, yeah, exactly. 20 summer of 2016 was the one that we, first presented had all those telegraphs there that was the one that we actually got together with third man originally ah. too on the down on the down low and it wasn't until the podcast time a couple years ago that we talked about it but yeah so you're right 2016 summer wow. show we we brought the um telegraph there yeah i do remember that and at the time i did you're right i didn't know it was copper sound pedals but mm-hmm. i do i did remember that i said that was a cool stutter pedal yeah yeah, mm-hmm. yeah we got we were fortunate enough um I got home after that show. I was at like I was doing um, some desk work at the job I was working at, and I got an email that said like "Urgent Telegraph on cover of Premier Guitar" or something oh, like that. Oh wow, yeah. And it was one of those ones that's like I gotta sneak out of here for a minute, <laughs> <laughs> you know, because it was like, hey, we're going to press. We just found out about this, blah blah blah. And I was like, that's really cool. It's like, again, like I said, a business card, but that kind of was the one that put us on the map, so to speak. Um, yeah was the original telegraph stutter well this one uh knowing both or having an opportunity to try both pedals this one is a crazy advancement of that original one once you tell us a little bit more of the of the innards that you put in there yeah for sure we we had um like i said so we did the triple graph pedal the octave pedal with um jack white and third man that came out in 2020 uh september 2020 um, so obviously we discontinued Telegraph V1. Part of it was we were, I think we wanted to discontinue it before the third man one, just to kind of let, for two reasons, we wanted to not have two of those on the market at the same time and confuse the market. And the other thing was we knew we wanted to do a V2 of the Telegraph eventually. And 
we wanted the market to dry up for it, so to speak. So dealers weren't stuck with V1s and whatnot. So we did a couple hundred of the V1. So we had done, it's now been just over two years of triple graph. And so what we did was we took the hardware that we learned while we were engineering and designing with Jack and the team at Third Man. We took that hardware and we knew we were going to use that for the top. So the original telegraph stutter um, was a smaller box than this. It was a standard B size. So anybody listening thinks about um, like a phase 90 from MXR or Mm -hmm. like a Dynacomp, that type of thing, right? That was what it was in. And it was on like a plastic and really thin steel um, metal. Like it was just a, a, a learner's telegraph key, like a CB radio thing or whatever. We designed this hardware out of uh, aluminum and stainless steel um, for the project with Jack. And we were like, okay, well, that's going to be what we use for Telegraph V2. So we started Telegraph V2. I, I can't recall off the top of my head when it was, but it was at least over a year ago. We knew we knew the top side. We knew it was going to have the hardware we used on the triple graph. We knew we wanted to do a couple things like modern features of you know having top loaded jacks for your ins and outs. We knew we wanted to have the original features, which were activate or kill. So kill was essentially signal goes through the pedal until you press down and kill it. Activate is the opposite on a polarity switch where nothing happens until you activate the sound. So we had those two that we knew we were going to do. But we had been messing with the idea of having a three-way toggle on this because the original one just had a two. And we, at some point, I think it was Jordan. He had been on the show last time when we did the Triple Graph episode. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Jordan was like, it'd be cool if we could do what we now call burst mode. So I think he probably had the original idea in his head and then... Um, we kind of was trying to find a way to execute it. So what we ended up doing was we designed a circuit that when you had the toggle switch in the middle position, uh, the player would be able to essentially access a timer and you could set the BPM of the stutter. So Jordan wanted to be able to press the telegraph and it would do a rapid burst of sound that you couldn't do with your foot. You'd only really be able to do chopping it up in like a DAW, you know? Um, So we wanted to be able to do like, hey, I want to be able to do like 800 BPM. So a really fast like uh, bend on my guitar and goes... I can't do that with my foot or my hand as accurately with as good of like um, that that um, perfectly spaced chopping sound. So we designed a, a circuit that would do that when you press down and then there's a knob on the face of this pedal where you can choose the BPM from around 110 up to around 900 or so. Mm-hmm. So we wanted to give the player the ability to do that like bursting so obviously we ended up calling it burst mode we allowed the player to choose whether it kills it in burst mode or it activates it in burst mode um so we were working on that um oliver myself had been doing the brunt of the hardware and the software design oliver did a lot of like the coding and stuff for it and i did a lot of um the external stuff the layout some of the analog side of things and we finally got the burst mode down and it became a reoccurring thing that jordan would pop his head through the door oh hey what if it could do this damn it that's a good idea we're gonna have to find a way to do that and that's where some of the features of this ended up coming to fruition so if anybody's seeing it at home or if you want to for the audio listeners as well on the side of this pedal we have an expression an expression jack which a lot of modern pedals and players are familiar with expression usually they control a parameter or two or if you're striming 87 parameters yeah (laughs) um so what happened was jordan was like hey it'd be cool if you could do it on expression pedal and i think oddly enough obviously we listen to a lot of jack white and i think i think um at the time it might have been we were listening to boarding house reach maybe or it might have actually been on fear of the dawn where there was a part where he does like this keyboard line and you you know the like the 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 pitch wheel only instead of it i think he actually changes the speed of something in 
one of the tunes. I'm drawing a blank on which tune. It might have been um, one of the singles off the record. But at any rate, it would be like he was like, "Oh, it'd be cool if I could actually, with my foot, adjust the BPM." So put it on like a treadle expression pedal. So we started getting our heads together, and we were like, "Okay, well, let's put an expression jack on it, and it'll overtake." the potentiometer on board and then the player can turn it on with their foot and they can use an expression for your heel and toe. That would be your speed. Cool. So we worked on that. We added that. We incorporated it. Um, you can now do the heel is the slowest, toe is the fastest. We're like, cool. That's awesome. Um, I think we're getting ready to put this out. Um, we get some prints and powders from our friend uh, Jacob down at F5 mm-hmm. who does our enclosure work. We get them up here. All the holes are everywhere we need to. The I, th- I swear, the day we got this in, Jordan goes, hey, can we control it with CV? <laughs> <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> and so we're like, okay, well, maybe. Explain. Could you uh, touch on that really quick bef- so that people maybe who aren't familiar with CV can uh, have an understanding of what that is? For sure. I, I'm not a spokesperson here for it or an aficionado. Essentially, it's control voltage is what the CV is for. And it, you can think of it as a swing between the brain, if you will, seeing the swing between zero and five, typically. Um, that's the average for CV gate. Essentially, like setting the BPM on something, mm-hmm. the CV is now controlling that there's obviously a much more elaborate thing and the synth world is huge on it um i'm on maybe chapter two here of cv i understand enough to talk about it a little bit but he was like and it wasn't necessarily cv that he said because jordan is still a whiz on the computer but cv isn't really a thing that's usually in his wheelhouse but he was like hey it'd be cool if i'm at 120 bpm in my daw and i can tell telegraph v2 do 120 BPM. So we sat mm-hmm. down and we were like, I don't know if we can do this. I, I reached out to Oliver and he's the CV guy. He does the digital side of things. And he's like, I don't think we can do this. And then I went to the data sheet for the chip that we're using and I realized there was a CV pin. I made a simple CV circuit based around the um, LFO in our Loma Prieta harmonic tremolo pedal, mm-hmm. breadboarded that up, touched it to the CV pin, and it worked. Oliver came out to the shop. He looks at it, crosses his arms, and he goes, huh. <laughs> <laughs> that shouldn't work. <laughs> yeah, because I think what happened was he thought it was more complicated because he knew the thing. He was like, okay, well, maybe we'd have to do this plus this, then convert it here, then right. do this, and blah, blah, blah. And I was like... Hey, this pin says CV, plug CV, go. You know, <laughs> very barbaric. And it actually worked. And I swear yeah. to you, we refer to it in the shop a lot of times as a callback. Ten minutes before I did that on a breadboard, he said, I'm calling CV dead in the water. And now it's one of those things where it's like, hey, remember we thought that couldn't be done? Yeah. So essentially, we got the enclosures in. It had a little slide switch on it. You guys had in front of you have one that has two slide switches on the side. Yes. Mm -hmm. The control one wasn't originally there. And great. We got all these enclosures in. Now we can't use it because we want to make a switch so you can choose either expression pedal or CV. So that was like, oh, great. We just got these enclosures and now they're no good. Um, So that was a fun little hiccup. Um, But getting back to some of the features that we did on Telegraph V2, I explained we got a burst mode for rapid BPM that the player can choose. Right. You, you can either control it, which lights up, which is really cool. Yeah. So what we did on this one, we did an led shaft potentiometer, something that you would see on our pal, Ryan McKay at yellow cake. He does Uh that on the furry burrito Yep, for the bias control. So yellow is for either the signals passing or not. And then the flashing red for burst mode gives the player a heads up on what the BPM is roughly. Yeah. Um, So you can control that via CV or expression, depending on how you have the expression jack set. Or your fingers. Or your fingers. The burst can either be activated or killed. We also set this pedal up to do our smart bypass technology that we've started rolling out with our pickguard series. And we are going to be putting that in some new pedals in the future where one press of the foot switch 
will turn it on latching and then holding will just have it be on until you release something similar that you'd see it in um, the flexi switching from earthquaker mm-hmm. and you see it on some pedals from walrus as well so one quick click turns it on one quick click again shuts it off just like a normal pedal uh-huh. but if you press and hold It'll just do the thing until you let go, which is a really fun feature for burst mode. Right. So you can just do a momentary burst for like a split second and let go. Um, so that was a feature that we wanted to incorporate. And if you're the type of player that doesn't want to have the the latching, like do it, you just want to do it as a momentary pedal like our original, we included a dip switch on the inside. You can shut the latching off. Oh. So you'll just have the momentary telegraph like the original one was. Um, so in addition to that, um, the original telegraph um, didn't have any power. It was literally just input jack to output jack and a polarity toggle. This one has an entire circuit in it. It's got power. It's got three jacks. It's got switches. It has the LED pot. Um, it has all these slide switches for control. Telegraph V2 that's currently out on the market if you don't have power or if you lose power on a gig, it still passes the signal and will still cut the audio like the original one will. You sneaky mm. guy, you. Yeah, so it's a fail-safe operation That's that cool. you get. So if you're in burst mode and you unplug this, no matter what mode you're in, you'll still be able to get traditional OG mode kill. The, um, the in and out actually also as another feature you can use them as dual taps. So if you have a delay pedal and a tremolo pedal and you plug both of them into the in and out of this pedal for the expression, the arm is now the BPM you set for your tempo. Okay, wait. Tony and I are both like, <laughs> wait, can you let run me, that bias uh, one more time? Yeah, yeah let, me, let, me, let me explain it again with a, better, a couple better examples. Okay, you've got a tremolo pedal that has tap tempo. Yes. You've got a delay pedal that has a tap tempo input. Yes. Right? Okay. You want to have the same BPM for both of them, right? Yes. So you plug your tremolo pedal's expression into Telegraph V2. You plug your delay expression jack into Telegraph V2 using the ins and the outs. And now that becomes your tap tempo unit, like your your dual huh. tap. So you plug both of them in there. So you're not actually using Telegraph in the signal chain. You're just using it as a controller. It's not really something that we generally boast about because I don't think somebody's going to buy a $240 pedal for their tap tempo. <laughs> but um, it's just another one of those things that we designed around and it does the thing. So That's crazy, <laughs> man. That's neat. So, yeah, we added a lot. The whole entire circuit board is taken up for circuitry um, to do fun, modern features. The CV thing is really cool. We're in the works of designing some accessories on the side for this thing for people to purchase, to use, to expand what you can do. Does it's it, amazing. Would, would one of those things be a little digitalometer kind of thing for the CV? Uh, it might be, yeah. <laughs> We've got a couple fun I'm things. Picking up in the what you're laying down. Exactly. Yeah, it's it's weird that there's a lot of ways. All this does is, it, it, I've usually referred to it like this doesn't have its own sound. All it does is kill it. But we found a lot of cool ways to make your sound not be on. Yeah. No, that's it's brilliant. I it's funny because uh, one of uh, I guess maybe one of our most played songs that we have on on Spotify um, is called Boundaries from the Valentinos. Uh, shameless, not not a totally shameless plug, but a, a <laughs> semi shameless plug here because I'm going to go somewhere with it. But the whole the, the the its song is is sort of based on this like super heavy duty helicopter chop okay. that I I started out with and that I use in varying uh, in increasing lengths uh, as, uh, as small bridges to the next parts of the songs, and immediately I was like. That's the boundary pedal right there, <laughs> because I I've struggled to find tremolo pedals that have the degree of chop and the speed, so the depth and the speed, and mm-hmm. and most importantly, not lose or I shouldn't say not lose the volume because that's a fallacy, but it's a perception. Yeah, it's a perception, but having a volume. Uh, knob to increase 
the volume so that there isn't that perception. Right. And I hit that and I was like, ha, 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 ha. that's the song pedal right there. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's, it's, yeah. Like I said, there's a lot of ways just to make you turn off, you know, yes. but it, do you it, have one got... I can use for Tony? <laughs> <laughs> that's a tall order, Todd. <laughs> So yeah. that's uh, – now, we have this in what I'm going to say is like military green, for lack of better terms, olive drab. Yep, army green. So we, we – we, when we did the original ones back in the day, I think by the end of its run or life cycle, a couple colors had fade out or a couple colors we were doing small runs, one-offs. I was hand painting, sponge painting. I was doing all sorts of stuff. When we were designing V2, I said, okay – I don't want to go out to the gravel driveway and start relicking these anymore. We want to have art on them. So we decided, okay, no relics, no um, like hand paint ones. If we want to do small batch cool ones, we'll do small batch ones. But we wanted to have art and everything. So the original one didn't have any controls except for a toggle. It's like, okay, we can get away with not having art. So we wanted graphics on this one to let the player know what they're doing so we had to have it printed. So in doing so... We were getting closer to wrapping up Telegraph V2 um, maybe about a year ago. And we sat down and we were like, okay, well, we got to do some colors. One of the cool things about Telegraph was we had so many options. I want to say we were up to like 19 at one point on the drop down Jeez. for our website, <laughs> which that was cool because people got a taste of like, oh, I can kind of get it in this many colors. That's cool. Yeah. So we were doing that, but we were like, we can't do that for this one. There's too much going on. The triple graph is out. We've got a ton of things in the like a ton of irons and fires and like we can't be out in the new england three degrees clear coating shit anymore you know yeah, yeah so um what we ended up doing was we sat down and i had a ton of swatches and i said to the to the guys essentially we brainstormed and i said i think it'd be cool to have like half a dozen colors where a lot of them are homaging the original and what we ended up doing was we sat down we were like okay we want a couple neutrals a couple colors and a couple like metallics, like essentially what it was. We want those kind of things, neutrals, metallics, and some color. So the original one was a Relic Army Green. That was our best seller. Just when people think of Telegraph Pedal, they think of the Relic Army Green. So we kept an Army Green, that olive drab that you guys have in front of you. Black was a popular seller, but I've always been on my high horse. I'm like, I'm so bored of just black petals. Mm. So I got a little bit, I got, I, I kicked and stomped my way to get the Milky Way in the, in the candy store. And <laughs> I was complaining to mom, I want this. So instead of doing black, we did um, this like gunmetal gray that we've called Gotham gray. So it's got a textured um, matte finish to it as opposed to like a stark black. So like I said, I kicked and screamed my way to like not have a black pedal, but we went to, with like a cool gray color. So we did that then for another it's a neutral. handsome we, pedal. Yeah. We, we, I, again, like that's going to sell. That's fine. We want to give some options. We did that. We did, um, uh, a textured white color for again, having a neutral. We did one that we called Carolina copper, which is a very like bright, fresh penny out of the mint. Um, mm -hmm. we did, we did Romeo red, which is a very like, um, it's a flat kind of on the crimsony side of red things. And then the last one we did was one we called Sierra blue, which is like a pastel, not pastel, but it's, it's essentially like if you it's took a muted like, blue, it's a muted blue. If there's somebody put gray in the batch. So we, we try to touch base on some homages. And it's almost a navy gray. I mean, it's, it's really yeah. close to a naval gray. Yeah. So it, it's got that muted thing. Like if it were like mauve would be its friend or like almost like a. a Please don't a ever make a mauve pedal. <laughs> <laughs> I've been I've been trying to find a mauve pedal because I'm obsessed with mauve. <laughs> oh, I can't get enough of it. But at any rate. Yeah. So we've got six currently. Um, on the market for Telegraph V2 between those colors, and um, yeah, it's been really it's been really great so far. It's only to this point, it's only been out about six weeks, so um, we're really happy with the turnout. Um, and like I said, we're going to have some more accessories coming down the line with it. Um, and just before that, we uh, also released a couple other pedals that I sent you guys too. That is correct. Yes. Let's talk about those real quick. 
I had an absolute blast playing all of these, by the way. Um, I mentioned actually on a, on a previous episode. Um, so first of all, let's let's start with the the Renegade. Um, that is your one knob uh, bass fuzz. Mm-hmm. And I had just got my Jack Cassidy bass kind of all set up. And so I opened this and I was like, oh, Hooray! I get to, <laughs> I get to have some some real fun and not just you know do bass sounds, which is also cool. But you know, um, and this thing sounded fantastic on it. I really really liked it, um, and it didn't take a lot to, to 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 you know. There's not a lot to fuss about with. You just do it, and it sounds good on your bass. But uh, please elaborate on this. Yeah. So Renegade. Um for actual production, other than when we did a limited edition Captain Hook, and we've done an ex- we did a small batch with a local tattoo artist for a batch of uh, fuzz pedals that we called uh, Cobra Fuzz, we didn't we don't have a fuzz in our lineup until now, so we never had a fuzz pedal. Um, and I had had so Renegade's origins actually extend back to twenty fourteen. I want to say 2013 or 14, I made a fuzz pedal for Jordan and still to this day, I think I screwed something up and it had this really cool weird bias thing where the tail end of the note would start doing this sizzle, this like, um, was it the Jacob's ladder thing with the Mm. electricity? Mm -hmm. It would start doing the sizzle and I've never been able to recreate it. It took me until about last year to finally get as close as possible with that circuit and we decided we were like okay well we need a fuzz in our lineup and at the time we were getting we wanted to discontinue gravity bomb and we were kind of in the stage of i wanted to revamp our minis so for since the really since like a lot of the companies start we've always had our duet series you know daedalus our reverb our our pretty well-known fox catcher overdrive and that type of stuff Mm -hmm. um two button stuff we wanted to redo and like reimagine our minis a little bit so renegade was kind of the first on uh the block for that so i designed an enclosure that's very similar to like an a size enclosure so anybody listening thinks the size would be like the ditto or the exotic ep booster Mm -hmm. so the ep booster is actually similar in that size so the renegade is in an enclosure that's small, like the size of the Ditto, only it's actually taller, so we could fit more stuff in there, and it would actually be the same height as our other pedals, so it'd kind of have that continuity there. So, I like Jordan, that, by the way. I think that that's, uh, that's smart. A lot, of, a lot of people don't think about that. Yeah, so we wanted to, first off, it, 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 it bred itself the fact that in a regular A size, we can't fit everything unless you flip the enclosure, unless you flip the circuit board over and have all the other components on the other side. And I generally tend to like to work on, um, like the pots are on one side, then all the other stuff is on the other. Um, so, and I also thought it would be cool to have our own enclosure, you know, but still be a familiar enclosure. So we designed that enclosure. We had our manufacturer make it. They sent us some samples. We liked it. Um, we got a whole run of them. And then we started doing like, what the layout is. And the nice thing with these is they're always the same layout, you know, power in out led toggle switch and the foot switch in the knob. So Mm -hmm. renegade was the first one that we kind of had ready. Um, we took that original, um, fuzz circuit, which was a modified tone bender MK one, which is a very common formula. You can also think of it. It's the, British version of the fuzz face, or I, mm-hmm. I think I should say that the other way around. The, um, the fuzz face. <laughs> yep, exactly. <laughs> so, um, Tone Better MK 1.5, some with very, very specific voltages. Um, they have to be biased to like two places after the decimal, um, the way that it's set up just to get that kind of sizzle. Um, is is so, that because it's. Um, uh, well, uh, sorry. Go ahead. No, it's it, it's cause, it's just because it's biased a certain way. So you know, a, you either have a transistor set up as a switch, or you have it set up as like a buffer or a line boost. And the way that this one is is it's biased at a very specific voltage that, as the guitar voltage signal starts dying, 
that one isn't kind of, I guess you, you can think of it as it's not being fed enough and it starts doing that. Not it's gated, but not like super like fuzz factory gated. It's like, it starts sizzling off, you know, sometimes you refer to it as like the bacon sound, mm-hmm, right? If you're yeah. cooking bacon on the skillet browning out. Yeah. So that type of thing. So we had that and I, I put a toggle switch on there so you could have more of a stock mode. So it's a more traditional, straightforward fuzz with a little bit of that bias at the end. And then, in the down position, you have more of that modern gated extra sizzle sound with just an output volume knob on it. It's very u- utilitarian, you know, because mm-hmm. our mini series is designed to be like under 150 bucks for all of them and straightforward. So that the first thing that came off the line ended up being Renegade, which was a name I had sat on. Usually my phone has like 50 names at any given time, whether I have a pedal in mind or ready or whatnot, but just kind of like, oh, that's a cool name. Let me jot it down. Right. And Renegade ended up coming to fruition. We were going to call it Tesla Fuzz, but there was already multiple things out there with that name on it. Yeah. It was a little too on the nose for me. And we ended up, we were going to, the other name we were going to call it was um, Enigma. However, there is also one out there from EHX. Um, cause they've been around since 1650. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Anyway, uh, Renegade was actually the name of my travel soccer team from the nineties. So it was just kind of a placeholder. We, the name itself had a little bit of like a tough bruntness to it. Yeah. And we thought it represented itself in this pedal. That's and, cool. um, that's what you have in front of you, uh, Renegade. Yeah. We it's our multi bias fuzz. Yeah, and uh, I just want to clarify something. I said when I said bass fuzz, I meant that in the in the form that I was using it. I actually plugged it into the bass first, yeah. and so uh, I know it isn't technically a bass fuzz, but um, sounds good. It, it sounds, sounds good, great though. with bass, man. <laughs> so uh, yeah. Anyways, just want to make that clarification. And yeah. Then, no. And, Sure. Then we also have I, I love this uh, the the gravity bomb. Now, I think if, when Tony and I were first talking about, well, Tony, why don't you talk about the just give your thoughts on the gravity bomb real quick? Well, I I, I think it's it's kind of a an expanded version of uh, well, I mean, it's it, I'm 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 just guessing, but I, mm-hmm. I we do like the EP booster around these parts. Yeah. Okay. And I liked some of the. I kind of like. I'm gonna. I'm gonna say. You kind of. I'm it. not. You're not it, sold. It's. I'm. I like that better. You like this better? Oh yeah. Well, it definitely gives you more flexibility, and uh, this one has three um, tonal settings. I guess you'd call it straight, and then um, a high boost and a mid boost. Uh, mm-hmm. which obviously the uh, the EP does not have. Um, well, you, you have those, you ha- you can adjust that in, in the dip switches inside. Well, yeah, sort of, yeah. but not as conveniently as this. Now, before we go any further, mm-hmm. Alex, do you have any, uh, are you taking any issue with the comparisons? Um, not an issue per se um with the comparison they're different beasts the ep booster is obviously based off the preamp section of the echoplex and right i think the ep was because uh, the first time i designed gravity bomb this was back in 2016 i think the ep booster was it's it's still a popular thing it, i think it was coming out or was kind of like in its heyday and on the market, we were seeing a lot of MOSFET and JFET coloration boosts based on preamp stuff. And those are really cool. And I think Gravity Bomb was my reaction to that. Mm. So as a Jack White fan and as a fan of kind of going against the flow of something sometimes, mm-hmm. um, we did Gravity Bomb because it was op-amp based and it was based around the micro-amp, which was one of Jack's always-on pedals. Mm-hmm. Um, they even just did a double pedal through Third Man that's both yeah. micro amps. So that was my reaction to that. I didn't want to do a JFET. Here's another preamp one. Yeah. And I want to do, okay, instead of it being a coloration one, it's literally a, it's transparent op amp, more U. That's all it is. It's not more color mm-hmm. and volume. It's literally just more U with some volume on it. And that's hey, where the gravity bomb was. That's where you, and that's where you got my love, man, because what I don't like about the EP is that it, I've, I just felt like it was coloring too much and, and it was either, it mm. felt like there was a blanket on it 
or mm-hmm. that it was just full freaking volume and nothing. Oh, you just don't know. know how to use it. Then. That's well, that's possible too. Um, but uh, the the nice thing is, I didn't have to learn how to use it. The gravity bomb I plugged in and did the thing I wanted no, to do. I, and I was okay, like that, yeah, yeah, I think that, I think that's a fair assessment because mm. there is a certain tonality to the EP booster, which I like. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And this one, I think, is more flexible in, where you can dial in uh, better different sounds. And you're right; it doesn't color the sound as much. So I think no. that's good. And yeah. one thing uh, the, that I did want to point out on both of these pedals that we were talking about is uh, being able to switch between 9 and 18 volts. And mm-hmm. there is a – I said, oh, there, there's not going to be that much difference. Uh-huh. But there's a significant difference when you run it at 18. Um, yeah. Definitely more more headroom on both of these pedals. Yep. And uh, I, I think it's a it, it makes a – that makes a – a tonal difference too. Mm. Yeah, for sure. The EP booster is a great pedal. It's, you know, when we were doing V2, like we, we liked V1 because it was literally clean. When we ended up actually, we, we used a program that can simulate and let you know, EQ curves and gain structures and stuff like that. We put the gravity bomb V1's circuit up on here and there is no, tonal characteristic changes the only time you see any drop off in its eq frequency band are in ranges that the human ear can't even hear anyway Mm. so we put that up and we were like oh damn it actually is what we called it of like a neutral transparent clean thing so when we were we had finished renegade and i thought oh man it'd be cool to have two and i think i said that after realizing we're just about out of gravity bomb enclosures and i I don't know if I want to order more. Like, we're getting Renegade. That's a different enclosure. Oh, crap. What are we going to do? We're running out of these. So it was weird. I went to a breadboard, and Gravity Bomb V2 happened in a couple hours, honestly. Um, I remember I we were like, we're running out of the enclosures. I want to do a V2. I think there'd be a cool V2 to do. I was driving one of my colleagues home, and we're driving to Boston to drop them off. And... I was saying, I, I, we're driving, we're like a couple minutes into the road because it's like essentially we were both building pedals all day. We're going to talk about pedals in the car and stuff like that. So I said to them, I was like, hey, what would be cool for Gravity Bomb V2? I don't want to do a treble boost because we have Broadway and I feel like treble boosts are very, th- there's so many of them. and They're cool, but I feel like a little overdone right now at this point. I don't want to just do a mini treble boost when we have Broadway, which is our germanium treble boost. Would bass be cool, you think? And they said to me, well, what about mids? Like, guitars, all it is is mid-range. You know, that's what the instrument is. And I was like, huh, okay, that would be cool. So I thought, let's do some mid-range. Now, now I didn't want Gravity Bomb V2 to get stuck in it's a mids booster pedal, you know? Um, Because, again, the frequency can be a specific thing for some people, or they don't like this or whatnot. So... I thought it was imperative to have the middle toggle position on Gravity on V2 is the original stock position. No mm-hmm. EQ change, just flat neutral, the stuff that you were saying that you like, Todd. So I was breadboarding an active mids network. So it's not passive. It's not reductive. It's actually additive. So it's actually adding that band pass, or that band is increasing by 35 or so dB. Um, in that circuit. So in the down position, it's 750 hertz is being boosted. And in the up position, uh, 1K is being boosted. So you have two different frequency band ranges that kind of help the voice of a lot of guitars, you know. Yeah. Um, With humbuckers, a lot of times 1K is nice to have a little bit more sharpness and the opposite sometimes with single coils. It really depends on what you're looking for. 750 almost has a little bit of that cocked wah range to it i i love where you know wherever that number you said was going to be mm-hmm. i really reacted to the when i hit the mid boost because um i'm always looking for just a little extra something uh for special parts and i hit that and i was mm-hmm. like oh my that that's the thing yeah, but it, and and we like I said, we wanted to keep the middle position as neutral, and then down is seven fifty, and up is one k. The nice thing that's really cool about this that 
um, we try to remind people is to think outside of this pedal itself. So if you put this after a drive pedal or a fuzz pedal, or a lot of times fuzz pedals don't have EQ on it or extensive EQ, put Gravity Bomb after your fuzz, put the 1K onto the 750K, and now keep it neutral so you don't increase the volume. And now all of a sudden your fuzz has two sounds to it. Yeah. You know, or you add this to the end of a tube screamer or something like that. So when you have Gravity Bomb post drives, you get a boost and you also accentuate the EQ because it's last in the chain. You can do it first as well. It's more um, elaborate when you do it post gain. And that's where yeah. I had mine. That's where I really thought it that shined. Shown. There you go. Shown? Yeah. Shined. Sheened. Sheened. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so throw Gravity Bomb V2 after something, and um, it can open up a different world or breathe new life into some of your drive pedals, or like I said, fuzz pedals that a lot of times it's just volume and fuzz maybe, and that's it. A lot of times fuzz is like to be wide open, mm -hmm. and you can um, throw Gravity Bomb in there with the two different frequency ranges. There's also still the clean if you just want more of you, because you're like, I like my sound, but I need to get louder. So there's more you in your amp now if you just keep it on the middle, and... Uh, yeah, Gravity Bomb was born out of, we ran out of V1 enclosures. We had a layout that we liked, and we thought it'd be cool if Renegade had a companion. So that's why they came out the same time in October. Mm -hmm. We put both of them out the same time. And I think for 129 bucks, I think there's a big value there in Gravity oh, yeah. Bomb. And once I think I think once people catch on, I think it's I think it's priced really It is a highly usable pedal. I mean, uh, I doubt that you could present a pedal board that wouldn't benefit from it. Yeah, that, I, I really appreciate it. Thank you for saying that. That's it, it, and it's a very ver and again, yeah, you could say, oh yeah, there's a, there's a there's a new boost pedal every month. Um, we for it being compact, a little bit taller, unique enclosure. Um, Jordan killed it with the artwork with the revamp. Mm -hmm. um, with um, it's got essentially the tube circuitry, the glass tube circuitry, put into like a falling bomb. Yeah, which is really cool and. Um, yeah, we just actually kinda... that would have been a better name, except with the W's in it. Oh, what the F F A W L L I N G B A W B M. <laughs> <laughs> it's the falling bomb. Uh, <laughs> we, you know, we missed a golden opportunity. You did. There. You should have <laughs> called me. I could have helped. Uh, next time, <laughs> next time, we need some advice. We're going to be hitting up Todd. <laughs> But yeah, no, um, we're really happy with um, the first two pedals that have come out in our mini series. I think we have um, five more queued up in our mini series. Wow, that's um, great, man! So that's these two are kind of leading the chain. That's exciting. Um, hopefully, we'll see all of those this year, um, depending on how releases go. But we've got kind of a new platform for our minis, and we're trying to. It, it, it's a nice platform for people that like the streamlined simplicity, but have enough options in it yeah. to go. And it's, it's, it'll be, they'll be anywhere from a hundred to 150 bucks for it. And, um, yeah, I think that for people should check out gravity bomb, you know, pretty much everybody needs a boost somewhere. Mm -hmm. And maybe this is the one for you since you'll have three tonal options. It won't just be volume. I think that's a, nice. a, an outstanding pedal, man, honestly. And it's, and it's, it's tough to do. I, when you enter into something that there's like already a million, it's like, Oh, let's come up with a new cereal. Have you seen the cereal aisle lately? <laughs> right. Like, where, yeah. what are we possibly going to offer? But right. it doesn't have to be a, a completely new kind of cereal. It can just be a better or more unique cereal. That's it. Well, yeah, we, and, we, and we had that pedaling. We had that discussion and quasi turmoil uh, inner here, like um, internal turmoil, if you will, because we wanted to make something, if we could, a little different. And and again, it's like it's the boost pedal world. Like, you know, how many exist and come out every year? And I remember when we decided to do the mids thing, we we had one of the guys here research, like, hey, I want you for the next hour just research boost pedals that have mids control like it has to have a mids knob or toggle on it and we couldn't find a lot um in general that were out there 
in our search, a lot of boost pedals are either they're a clean boost or they are a certain frequency in their coloring, like the EP booster or preamp pedals like you'd see from like uh, Earthquake or like the Arrows or the Bows or you would see Germanium treble boosters. Um, you wouldn't like it's it was hard for us to find an active mids boost pedal, you know, um, so that was the thing. And so we priced it very competitive um, and we think it's different than a lot of boost pedals out there because again i mean i'd encourage anybody listening if they're thinking about boost pedals and they play guitar it's even good on bass too because you can really enhance those frequencies having an active mids control Mm -hmm. in your boost pedal it's weird to say that that's not really out there it's kind of foreign like almost every boost pedal is like it's just a simple volume, maybe gain, maybe tone is on there, um, stuff like that. You don't really see active mids control. So we're trying to really like push that, which is why we've referred to um, – Gravity Bomb is referred to as our clean boost and mids enhancer. Yeah. Well, maybe you could rename it the mid boostier. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh boy. Oh boy. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. We didn't. We, but you, you're doing it. You're doing it, Tony. You're you're putting it into it's a mids pedal, which we didn't want to. You know, we didn't want to pitch ourselves, pigeonhole ourselves in there. Yeah. Of like it's a mids only pedal because we wanted to give the player the option of either clean or two different types of mids and. I feel like we executed it pretty well. Okay. Then just the boostier. It did. Just the boostier. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now I'm picturing Todd and the. <laughs> oh, no, no. Get that out of here. No, no. There's a site oh, you dear. won't soon forget. <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, my. I'm all blush. I'm all asunder over here. Oh, yes. Okay. Let's. Uh, let's. We're, we're, you know what? I can I can tell Jared is idling that that El Camino out there. Oh yeah. Yep. Let's do this, man. Ladies and gentlemen, it's come to the time of a little game we like to play called Would You Rather. This week Tony's gonna read the Would You Rather that I just thought of. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Jared. I, I know that this is this is a true honor and and I and a privilege to be able to. You know, read. I love you. I'm just, I'm just kidding. Around. I know, but you know, I I just I just thought that since uh, you know, in my would you rather or no, your would you rather this week? No, my uh, rock and roll week. Um, that I thought we should have a little tribute to Jeff Beck. Sounds good. So this week. Despite all odds and despite all reality, you are given the opportunity to own one of two of Jeff Beck's guitars. Mm. The first one, Seymour Duncan, has been so kind as to provide his 1954 Fender Esquire, which, by the way, is on loan to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Oh. I did find out that, that All right. little, little tidbit of information. We talked about that earlier. This is the guitar that Jeff used between actually a very short period of time, 65 and 66. By the time 66 rolled around, he moved on to uh, Les Pauls. Um, but anyhow, it's a cool guitar. The other option is his what he called a 1954 Fender Strat. In reality... It was actually a 1963 Fender Strat, and the dead giveaway is the Rosewood Fingerboard. Now, this Strat, um, it, was, it has a stripped body, uh, obviously Rosewood Fingerboard. Uh, the pickguard has a broken little horn, and he used this from 69 to 77, um, in his work with the, the Jeff Beck group, and among others. So this was kind of his main gig guitar for a very long period of time. So the Would You Rather this week is, would you rather have Jeff's 54 Fender Esquire or his 54 slash 1963 Fender Strat? Mm. Jared, let's start with you since this is your segment. Um, it's, I have to pick one, but both, you know, are gonna <laughs> both no option. 
You know the rules. I, I, I know, but uh, both of those. The ghost the of Yogi Berra lives large. <laughs> uh, oh, dear. Before all that riffraff, I was going to say, <laughs> both are fantastic sounding guitars. They're old wood guitars. And I've played Telecasters from the 50s, and I've played Stratocasters from the 50s and early 60s. And the 50 strats and tellies I've played to me resonate even more. They they're they're better. So I would definitely go with the uh, the early. And I also want to say that I don't want Jeff Beck's either of them because of of what Andy Harrison told us. He said the way that those guitars were set up and and he set up his gear for him, he was touring with him or something. And he said when he played through it, it didn't sound good at all. And then when Jeff Beck picked it up, yeah, it sounded amazing. So, yep. but that's, that's as that's, Clapton gave him like the ultimate uh, compliment. He said it's it's all in Jeff Beck's hands. I mm-hmm. mean, it is. But Probably the the telecast or the uh, the no caster, the or, Esquire, Esquire, yeah, 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 broadcaster. I would definitely definitely take that one. Okay, so not both. No, okay. I would like you to have interrupted both. him, <laughs> but he was getting ready to say both are great guitars. Yeah, but it was yeah, way funnier. I, but there was I a tried. there was a pause there, and of course Todd jumped right in. Yeah, I made didn't his jump. Own, I reacted. He made his own reality of what I was going to say. But. <laughs> Tony, what about you? Um, Tony, well, what about you? <laughs> I'm going to go. I I think I have to go, even though he didn't. He only played it for maybe a year or so. I think I have to go with the Esquire as well. Um, I am as as with Todd, not a huge Strat fan. And probably the volume knob is, or the pot is probably worn out from all of his pinky swells. Um, but that would that would be a cool one to have too, because it's you know that was no, one of his. One. Both are nice guitars. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going with the I'm going with the uh, Esquire. Esquire. All right. Uh, let's see, Alex. How about yourself? Yeah, I think I'll do both. <laughs> <laughs> Popular order. <laughs> um, yeah, so this is an interesting one for me personally because um, I don't really have an association with Jeff Beck um, as like even a listener um, other than just appreciating what he's done. But um, I'm not a – so I love tellies. I don't like one pickup guitars because mm. I'm – like my telly, you could duct tape it on the middle position. And that would be fine for me because as soon as I go to the bridge, I miss the neck. And as soon as I go to the neck, I miss the bridge. And I'm just like, well, I guess I'm stuck in the middle. So, but that also being said, I not a strat guy. And I think I'm not a strat guy to the extent of, I'd still go with the Esquire. Nice. Mm. I also, but I, I do, I do. Uh, and still to the point, I don't like tummy cut and arm cut, yeah. but I'm still probably going to go with the Esquire. Well, you can always add a uh, a neck pickup because the body's already routed for it. So, yeah, that's right. You can always drop that in. You know, make a priceless guitar want- <laughs> and, yeah. more, and more usable. <laughs> Are you going to want both, Todd? Uh, <laughs> we no, know you're not going to want both. We no, know I'm not. gonna. I'm actually going to surprise everybody. I'm going to take the Strat. Nice for wow. uh, for for. Uh, posterity's sake for the fact that this would have been jeff beck's guitar like i, I not to not to play it at all because I, I that's like kryptonite for me mm-hmm. but um i think th- any time that i've seen him play or heard him play it's been on that strat with the bot with the you know with the whammy and everything and and it's just like that's how i re- that's how i it's it's immediately associated with him Mm-hmm. So, I think for the sake of saying this b- b- belonged to you know one of the greatest ever, this then it's the Strat for sure. Okay, so we got uh, three Esquires and a Strat. Yep, hold the onions. 
All right, let's. Uh, we got to thank a few people, and then That's we'll true. then we'll say a, a Jew to our friend Alex. That's right, because at this point of the t- show, Todd, we thank, we love to thank a special group of people. These are our executive producers. Now, an executive producer makes this show possible. How do you become one? Head over to patreon.com forward slash the guitar knobs and check out a couple different levels in which you can participate. Become a sponsor of this very podcast. Each level comes with some very, very nice thank you gifts, I might add. Um, And in some cases, in some of the upper echelon, I believe there's a copper sound flashlight included, isn't there? There Ah, so keep an eye on that. But in in addition to all that great stuff, there's one thing more. Jared, what is that? You get to have your name right on the thing. That's right. So that's what I'm going to do right now. So special thanks to these executive producers. Moon Guitars, Vader and Pedals, John Halverson, Rick Calhoun, Trevor Gunberg, Elad Mizrahi, Mike D, Richard Kendall, Mark Garten, Matt Hart, James White, Justin Jones, Anthony Jamalaro, Bill Gola Guitars, John Esterley, Anthony Lathrop, Stefan Lem, Michael Senchuk, Ken Sayers, Doug Christ, Darren Gregory, Tom Barazin, Rusty Sneeden, Ralph Gottschalk, Don Kloss, Gregory Randall, Brett Hogarth, Eric Hemmer, Stuart George, Michael Furman, Andrew DeHaan, and that bloke, Andrew Bell. That'd be right, me lad. But wait, Todd, there's more because we have a special, special group of executive producers. Mm. These are our grand poobahs. That's right. Uh, They wear a fez upon their head whilst listening to the podcast. Mm -hmm. And And at the same time. At the same time. So special, special, special thanks to these grand poobahs. Tommy Manasco, Ricardo Igareda. David Kaminga, Brandon Wound Pickups, Hex Matos, Michio Murakishi, Bob Crouch, Jack Cadian, Sam Jett, also known as Dr. Demo, Tyler Rines, LSJ Music Company, John Williams, James Pennington, Adam Johnson, Steve Keys, Cody Foster, Science of Sound. Brian Robison, Jonathan Jerusic, Corey Nigro, Michael Van Zant, Tim Nowak, Jonathan Daly, Martin Cliff, Sean S. S. David Poe, Billy Spitfire, and Congregation Gear yeah, Demos. Yeah, they're going to be on the That's show right. soon, actually. I can't I'm wait. Yeah, thank you, cool. thank you. All right. Well, uh, as we always say, we can't do it without you. I said at the beginning of the show. Yes, I mean, you did. We could, but it sure wouldn't be a whole lot of fun. And it, uh, you know, all that stuff. Basically. So thank yeah. you. Thank you. And if you're interested, uh, get on it. That'd be great. No we'd, time we'd to We'd love to read your name off and send you some cool things. All right, everybody. We need to say a humongoid thank you to Alex Garaldi of Copper Sound Pedals. First, for being a solid dude. Second, for being a friend of the show. And third, for making really fantastic gear. That's right. Thank you guys for having me on a three-peat, if you will. It was really, really great to talk to you guys again. Um, as always, um, two more shows and you get a special blazer. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> get green a, jacket or gold jacket? Yeah. Orange. Orange, orange, of orange course. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see here. And, and people can go get those things at coppersoundpedals.com, correct? Correct. Yeah, you can find us there. You can find us on social media platforms like Instagram, Facebook. You can also check out our collaboration we did with Jack White at Third Man Records, um, thirdmanstore.com. You can check out the Triple Graph Polyphonic Octave Up, Down, Kill Switch Effects Loop. Check that out. Crazy and, cool pedal. Yep, you can check out all that stuff. Check out our brand new Telegraph V2, Renegade, and Gravity Bomb V2 as well. Brilliant. Uh, Tony, bah. just head over to pickguardian.com. Check out a couple of things that I offer. But by and large, what I do 
is custom work. So shoot me an email and let me know what you're trying to do. You know, we can make something work. Big Guardian. You always do. BigGuardian.com. Jared. Catch me, jared.allen.brandon on Instagram, and we will chat about whatever you want to chat about that is guitar related. I really wish you would have said, catch me outside. How about that? At Jared, <laughs> catch me outside. <laughs> catch me outside. <laughs> in, in the El Camino. All catch right. Catch me can, outside. You can show me. You can. Sorry, don't show me anything. Well, <laughs> uh, that's weird. <laughs> send, send me an email, uh, Todd at the guitar knobs.com. You can also DM me on Instagram at guitar knobs. We'd love to hear from you. I, I, it is so great when we get messages from all you guys out there. So uh, send us something. And, hey, we'd love to get your Would You Rathers. Let's, Absolutely. Let's read some, shall we? Go get yourself some Copper Sound pedals. Have a fantastic guitar week. And subscribe. Yeah. yeah. I love that. I love that you love that. Yeah. Ooh, love to love you, baby. Right. <laughs> oh, hi, Alex. Pissed. All you, right. guys been, like, you guys have done like 300 of these or something? Uh, like yeah, you'd think. Uh, you'd think. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but I said that. Um, uh, no, I said that. <laughs> you revisionist mother... Hello. That's Hello. better. Oh. Hello. That's better. <laughs> Test. <laughs> I'm the type of guy that just eats standing up over the sink to not make a plate to do dishes. Just throw something in me really fast. I... I really don't care about food. I got to wow. check with Tony. Did you also in this in your head go, I'm the type of guy that likes to stand at the sink and eat? No, no it just I me. did not. Oh, okay. It was, it was all Ernie, are business. Are you poop somewhere? What? How about you, Todd? How? <laughs> 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 oh, so I don't to, that's a good idea. Go to the Tony restroom. Tony just wears a diaper. Yeah, why yeah. not? I'm, well, like that's an, how, I'm like an astronaut. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's how I picture Tony anyway. Yeah. <laughs> a big astronaut. Big baby. Uh, Tony. Hey, give me a minute. Go. I got I to gotta hit the can. You, you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Making sure, trying to be pro, you know? Yeah. Well, you're doing a good job so far, unlike Antoine. Why am I introducing Tony? Because <laughs> he's got the would you rather. I've got the would you rather. But I read the Would You Rather. <laughs> but you don't have it, do you? Tony's got the wheel, all right? Okay. No. Yeah, here we go. <laughs> you guys are going to go, what did we do, Todd? What oh, about you? Oh, Let oh. me get a little bit of this. Here's some patch cables. Pretty much. Off yeah. the racer. <laughs> you, know the, you know the recipe. And away we go. <laughs> well, that's it for these knobs. Please visit our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash the guitar knobs visit our website at the guitar knobs.com for all of our past episodes four on the floor blog and other good stuff you can connect with us on social too at our facebook page and share your gear and stories on our facebook group also be sure to check out our instagram at guitar knobs catch you next time